Okay, uh, namaste everyone. I'm Shweta and I would like to welcome all of you to the first edition of the six weekly uh, workshop series on Occupied Territories of India by Pakistan. The workshop is organized by Jammu and Kashmir Study Center, which is a think tank dedicated to the academic study and dissemination of facts on Jammu and Kashmir. The idea of the study center was conceived in the wake of uh, turmoil going on in the region for several years. A group of professionals, including academicians, uh, lawyers, entrepreneurs, they got together to research and understand the truth and facts of the region. An in-depth study followed on the history, civilization, culture, and social aspects of the region, and thus the study center was formed. It's been there for over a decade now, with 28 chapters across different cities and over 1,000 uh, contributors who took up this initiative to study uh, and spread awareness. Many uh, participants today belong to the studies uh, center and we applaud the effort put in by them. If anyone wants to be a part of the study center, they can reach out uh, to the chapter in their region and uh, we would really encourage that. Uh, now, many of us uh, would have heard about the Shada Temple and University that was a prominent center of learning in Jammu and Kashmir, was said to be at par with Nalanda and Takshashila University and was famously known for its library that um, scholars travels long distances to access. The Shada script that unfortunately has become nearly extinct, extinct was cultivated in this renowned temple university. The region is also home to Shina, Khovar, Vakhi, Domaki, and Balti languages, and many archeological re relics of Buddhism. Well, over the next six weeks of this workshop, we'll be revisiting facts like these, which could otherwise become a distant memory for us, especially the younger generation in India and worldwide. And to help us through this, we are very fortunate to have with us Alok Bansalji, who is the director of India Foundation and an adjunct professor at New Delhi Institute of Management. He's the secretary general of Asian Eurasian Human Rights Forum and the executive director of the South Asian Institute for Strategic Affairs. He's also a facilitator for India Policy Group on Afghanistan for track two dialogues by Frederick Ebert Stiftung. He has a defense background and has served in the Indian Navy for 32 years. He has written extensively in international and Indian professional journals, as well as for Indian, Pakistani, and international newspapers, and has several publications to his credit. Alokji is a geopolitical expert with special focus on occupied territories of India. He has authored several books on it, including Gilgit Baltistan and its saga of human rights violation and Occupied Territories of Bharat. We thank Alokji for his time as despite his extremely busy schedule, he has committed to conduct this six weekly workshop on Pakistan occupied territories of Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. Over the next six weeks, he'll be taking us to different parts of this region, uh, give us some historicity about these regions and also provide us with some insight into the social, cultural and political status of these regions, including uh, developments post-1947. Today is the first day of this academy exercise and uh, Alokji will be starting with an introduction to Pakistan occupied territories of Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, this is uh, uh, indeed a great opportunity for me to interact with JKSC UK and uh, talk to you all. I think uh, the job that's been assigned to me is to conduct six workshops, interactive workshops over uh, next six weeks. Uh, workshops by nature are interactive, uh, but today what I'm going to do is to cover uh, territories of Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh under park occupation. I want to give an introduction. And why this introduction is necessary is because there is a lot of confusion uh, amongst many minds as to what is uh, this territory, because a lot of people use wrong nomenclatures often or things like that. So I just would like to give you a brief introduction. So today, maybe I may exceed a little time. Otherwise, from next week onwards, you'll find that I'll stick myself to 15, 20 minutes and then go on for more interactive question answer sessions. So uh, this is uh, what it is. And uh, I'll be sharing, uh, I think all of you can see the PowerPoint which I have projected. Uh, this is how Jammu and Kashmir has been uh, reconfigured by government of India with effect from 31st October, 2019. As you know, this is the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. It's been configured into two union territories that is Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. 
which you can see on the screen. The configuration, basically you could see how it has been divided into different parts because the territory under Pakistani control has been divided into two different entities. Uh, I will come to it in a little uh, bit of a time. But before I come to Pakistan's occupation, we also need to understand, I'll briefly touch upon the Chinese occupation because there is a slight difference between the territory that the China has occupied and the territory that Pakistan has occupied. And this we need to understand very clearly. We need to understand that Pakistan's, the dispute with Pakistan is territorial in nature. Pakistan perceives that the entire princely state of Jammu and Kashmir as it existed in 1947 is theirs. Whereas with China, it's only a boundary dispute. China does not claim that Jammu and Kashmir is theirs, but they believe that the boundary of Ladakh goes from this point, and we believe it goes according to what we project on our map. The total territory, which is under Pakistani occupation, is approximately over 78,000 square kilometers, which has again been configured into two different parts, around 13,000 plus square kilometers, which we call POJK, and 64,000 plus square kilometers, which is now Pakistan-occupied territory of Ladakh. Whereas in China, uh, Chinese occupation, we have about 37,500 square kilometers. In addition, there is about 5,000 square kilometers plus of Shaksgam Valley, which has been ceded to China by Pakistan uh, as part of a bounded agreement which they came into in the March 1963. What is more important is that the territory under Pakistan's occupation has a significant population. And uh, its population today is around 6 million or maybe a little more because unfortunately, the uh, census figures of Gilgit Baltistan have not been declared by Pakistan, although five years plus have lapsed since the last census. Whereas in case of Chinese occupation, the region is by and large uninhabited, except for some houses in a divided village of Demchok and some cantonments which have come up here and there. And even more significant is that with Pakistan, the line of control is demarcated and delineated up to a point which is known as NJ9842. Beyond that, it is not delineated. That is where we have Siachen Glacier and we have had some conflict in the past. But with China, the line of actual control is neither demarcated on ground nor delineated on map. So there are different perceptions of line of uh, actual control on this particular area. Now, having uh, done that, I will come to the subject matter proper, which is territories under Pakistani occupation. And uh, we wanted to uh, cover that particular uh, subject, but I thought it was essential to give it a right perspective, to give you a brief uh, idea of what is uh, Chinese claim and what are the territories which are under Chinese occupation. Now, when we talk of uh, Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir, or we talk of territories under Pakistan's uh, control, a lot of people believe that what Pakistan calls AJK or Azad Jammu and Kashmir is the territory which is under Pakistani control, which is actually a very, very big myth. Because what Pakistan has done is, Pakistan has divided this particular territory that he has under its control into two parts. There is a very small sliver of land, which is less than 15% of the territory, which Pakistan calls as AJK. Now, this area is primarily in Jammu region. It has got uh, two-third of its uh, territory virtually in Jammu region, which includes Mirpur division and uh, Punch division in Jammu area, of, uh, and one Muzaffarabad division in Kashmir. We used to call it as Mirpur Muzaffarabad. That is the popular name because these are the two big principalities in this current area. Pakistan, as I said, tries to call it Azad Jammu and Kashmir and given it a facade of an independent state. How independent it is, we will cover it in subsequent workshop. But suffice to say that there can be nothing bigger uh, facade than this. The entity has its own president, prime minister, Supreme Court, etc. But uh, it is all sham and we'll come to it. The population of this area is over 5 million. But less than 5% of the population of this so-called entity speaks Kashmiri. Now, this fact must be understood that the people here ethnically belong more to 
they are Gujars or Pahari, Pahari's because bulk of the population speaks Pahari, Potwari languages, and a significant chunk speaks Gojri, which is spoken in rest of India as well. Uh, they often say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I have got some pictures of this area, which you need to see. This is actually a track to Nanga Parvat, which actually leads one of the uh, views, just to give you how uh, scenic or important this area is. This is the capital city, Muzaffarabad, where there's a big bend, as you can see in the river, actually. And this is what signifies this. This is Indus River. This is, again, uh, uh, Neelam Valley, a bridge there, just to show you how uh, this place looks. And this is the most iconic figure. As I said, uh, um, Shweta talked about Sharda Peet. We will discuss about Sharda Peet when I cover Meerpur Muzaffarabad in greater detail. But just suffice to say, it's one of the iconic uh, entities. In fact, it was a highest seat of learning in the good old days. Uh, people from Ibn Battuta to Vinsan all have mentioned uh, in glowing terms about Sharda Peet. So Sharda Peet was, of course, one of the highest uh, seats of learning. We will come to it subsequently as I go along. Now I come to Gilgit Baltistan. Now this is far more important. As I said, immediately after Pakistan occupied uh, this particular territory, on 28th April 1949, they entered into an agreement with the head of the Muslim conference, which was the political party, which had not a single representative from this area and separated this particular territory from rest of the territory. And then since then they have been fooling the world by calling it Azad Jammu Kashmir, not realizing the world also not realizing that more than 85% of the territory was virtually kept as a colony by Pakistan uh, and was called the Northern areas till 2009, northern areas of Pakistan. Uh, it is an extremely rugged terrain, high altitude. As a result, the population, it's a very sparsely populated area, has a relatively less population. It has an extremely rich cultural and linguistic heritage. There are small valleys which have distinct languages. In fact, there is so much of linguistic uh, 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 div uh, disparity here that each valley has a different language and some of those languages are very, very unique in their own right. And the culture, the pre-Islamic culture of this region is still flourishing. The people, despite having embraced Islam, uh, continue to adhere to their pre-Islamic traditions and customs. Of course, in this particular area, the discontentment against Pakistan's administration has been growing. And uh, last 15 days, we have seen there have been huge demonstrations. I'll just show you some pictures of that also, but uh, we will uh, come to it. This is, of course, the a plateau. Now, what you'll realize it is at that height, at that heights of over uh, 4,000 meters, you have a, a flat plateau called Devsai Plateau, which is the second highest plateau in the world after Tibetan Plateau. So uh, this is just a picture just to give you an idea of this particular plateau. And uh, now what I'll try and do is to show you uh, uh, this particular uh, place, uh, which is, uh, you can see this is a protest that is taking place. Uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to hear it or not. Uh, this is what, are you able to hear it? No, no, I love you. No, this is a video of twenty eighth December. Now, this is uh, another video where people in Skardu are uh, talking uh, and requesting people that they need to open the Kargil Skardu road, which would connect them with their brethren across the line of control so that people can link up culturally. And you can see this video again.
no sound. But it's okay, we can. So these videos don't lie. Now these are actually just giving you an uh, uh, things how people are uh, uh, actually, and this is another video of the same thing which I just wanted to show. This is from the other side. If you would have seen. So these were some of the videos. I'll show you again more uh, videos. This is another uh, protest rally. You can see in uh, three cities. It's actually, uh, this is on 28th December. Uh, 20, 28th December, just about uh, 10 days back. so these are uh, the videos just to show how much the discontentment has been there in this particular area uh, these videos are not to for any propaganda purpose just to give you the truth so i just wanted to show you these uh, Video. This is important and this is just two days back. This is 5th of January. This is actually a protest in a place uh, close to Gilgit called Miyawala, where people are protesting against a land grab by Pakistan army. And this you need to uh, see. In fact, uh, This is just to show you that how protests are going on in this particular part where people are protesting against a, a land grab by Pakistan army using some archaic provisions. Even though the land is communally owned, they are trying to occupy this. And when the people protested just two days back, Pakistani army actually fired at them. And this is what I just wanted to show you. And uh, we'll show you this last video where Pakistan army is actually firing at them. And this you need to just see. You can see this is the same place where the protests were happening at them. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So just to sum up what I have given, uh, told you today, I think I'd just like to give you a comparison of these two territories which Pakistan has divided into the occupied territories. One is, of course, Mirpur Muzaffarabad, which we can rightfully call now Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir, 
since uh, it is the part of the union territory of jammu and kashmir which is under pakistan's occupation and the other is gilgit baltistan which we could call it pakistan occupied territory of ladakh because it is the part of the union territory of ladakh now what we need to understand is that the meerpur muzaffarabad is less than 15% of the territory gilgit baltistan is more than 85% of the territory uh, although 70% of the population is as of now meerpur muzaffarabad and only 30% of the population is in gilgit baltistan but this population is increasing because there is a huge migration which is taking place and as i said meerpur muzaffarabad has an external facade of independence whereas gilgit baltistan has been treated as a virtual colony with no constitutional status till recently its citizens enjoyed no democratic rights even today the democratic rights are seriously impinged and you could see the protests that's what has been shown meerpur muzaffarabad has been by and large integrated culturally into pakistan though even there there is a resistance to pakistan's uh, imposition but in gilgit baltistan the region has a very rich pre islamic culture and enormous linguistic and cultural diversity there are huge camps by radical outfits including anti india organizations which have been established in meerpur muzaffarabad whereas in uh, gilgit baltistan tehreek e taliban pakistan is making its presence felt so radicalization is increasing lt was encouraged uh, uh, so they have a uh, uh, during kargil war and as a result there is a huge sectarian conflict that is taking place in this particular part of the world what is even more important is that the state subject rule which does not allow outsiders to occupy land or become citizens of this area is still applicable in meerpur muzaffarabad but this rule had been removed in gilgit baltistan by zulfikar ali bhutto in early 70s and consequently there is a huge migration of pakhtuns and punjabis into gilgit baltistan whereas migration from pakistan into meerpur muzaffarabad has been relatively low and the figures are very clear the population grew by 26% in 20 years that is between 98 and 2017 in the case of meerpur muzaffarabad but in the case of gilgit baltistan the population grew by 63% between 98 and 2011 2017 census report has not been declared by pakistan to date in case of gilgit baltistan this is primarily to prevent agitation because once the figures are out the people can see how uh, demographic changes have been brought about by bringing people from outside and so that people do not protest and that's why these reports have been buried in the case of meerpur muzaffarabad large tracts of land were submerged when mangala dam was built and what happened is the old meerpur town actually went under water and that's why you have a huge meerpuri diaspora today in uk all these people who got a uh, lot of compensation and their relatives were already in uk actually pulled them out because they had no attraction to the new town which was built or the land which was given to them in lieu so their traditional land was submerged and people were abroad why i will again cover it when i cover meerpur muzaffarabad one of the reasons for having a huge meerpuri diaspora in uk is this mangala dam which submerged a large pop an entire city and as a result large number of people migrated to uk and then once one relative moved they pulled others because people did not have any historical or cultural connect to the new entity where they were shifted now similar thing is being tried in the case of gilgit baltistan where a bhacha dam is being constructed now this will uh, this is coming up on indus river and will flood huge uh, areas especially in gilgit baltistan now this dam is so well uh, structured that the power house is in khyber pakhtunkhwa province of pakistan so the royalty will go to khyber pakhtunkhwa but the inundation will take place in gilgit baltistan which is actually a part of jammu and kashmir so the population that will suffer is in gilgit baltistan the benefit will go to khyber pakhtunkhwa this dam will provide water for irrigation which in any case can go only downstream that is to pakistan and uh, power which will of course benefit pakistan and because of these reasons what we find is that the opposition to pakistani occupation by locals in meerpur muzaffarabad has been relatively muted but in gilgit baltistan the resentment against pakistan is very very strong 
uh, this with this i come to an end but before i come to an end i just wanted to give a very important statement and that is a nation loses its territory not when it is occupied but when it is forgotten please remember the jews were out of jerusalem for thousands of years but they would every year make a resolution next year in jerusalem and consequently even if after thousands of years they are back in jerusalem so it doesn't matter if somebody is occupying that territory it should not go out of your mental space unfortunately today uh, indians and indian diaspora uh, has not kept itself abreast of what's happening in this particular part of the world and they have not made an effort to know what are what is happening in this part we should be aware of what is the geography of this area what is the population what is the demographics what is the uh, political developments what is the structures so everything that we can know about this area we should be aware because as long as this territory remains in our mental space it will be ours if not today tomorrow or some day that's all i just wanted to say thank you very much now i am open to any question and answers that you wish to ask i would be happy uh thank you for the session uh, the beginning i have a very specific question uh, we are seeing the history of you know pakistan being hell bent upon uh, asking kashmir or uh, you know trying to take uh, kashmir under their belt so apart from the pride factor is there any other economic social or you know geopolitical importance to this area yeah uh, firstly let me clarify uh, as far as pakistan is concerned and uh, this is my firm belief of course in uh, social sciences there are no perfect answers but this is my firm belief that kashmir is just a manifestation of the problem it's not the cause of the problem so pakistan has to have a problem with india because it has to justify its existence the two nation theory is so flawed an ideology that to justify its existence it has to have an animosity with india that's the first part now coming to importance of jammu and kashmir yes there is a geo uh, in pakistan's case today there is a huge uh, importance because bulk of the fresh water resources of pakistan actually come from jammu and kashmir uh, please understand uh, almost i think 75% or 80% of the water that comes to pakistan comes through rivers Uh, that traverse through jammu and kashmir or are part of the indus water system and emanating from the east the second important facet which you need to understand is that jammu and kashmir especially the territory which it occupies has given pakistan a connectivity with china which it would not have had which is a very very important strategic factor for it a uh, bulk of its uh, strategic inputs which have come have come through this even the china pakistan economic corridor which uh, pakistan considers as a panacea for all its problems actually passes through this if this was not there with them there would have been no cpac pandit ji is ask uh, has asked that what was the map when last hindu king ruled kashmir and how was it in 1947 during maharaja hari singh's rule uh the territory that we show on our maps you can say roughly corresponds to what maharaja hari singh occupied though there are of course i have a different view because uh, maharaja hari singh the territory that he claimed was even more than this uh, but uh, we could uh, 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 as far as the the pakistani side is concerned uh, this area roughly corresponds to what maharaja hari singh controlled but please understand maharaja hari singh also had vassals and one of his vassals was chitral which is now a part of uh, khyber pakhtunkhwa province of uh, pakistan now maharaja suzerainty over uh, chitral uh, may vary but uh, the fact of the matter is that the mahatar of chitral or the ruler of chitral used to pay taxes to maharaja so uh, that uh, territory could also or should also have been claimed by india in 1947 when we uh, gained independence and when maharaja acceded to uh, india uh, on the chinese side of course there were territories which uh, you know, 
uh, we are not claiming today uh, uh, where there were contrasting claims because if you see some of the old maps, you will see uh, that from Gilgit Baltistan to Aksai Chin, there is a straight line. It goes up where Raskam Valley, which is north of what we claim today, was also with us. Similarly, Tagdumbash Pamir, which is actually north of uh, Gilgit Baltistan, also was part of Hunza, which was actually a feudatory state and a, a vassal of Maharaja of Kashmir. So there are, of course, these issues. I think uh, if I cover those historical facts, I think we'll go beyond the time permitted because that would come more if we are discussing uh, the territories with China and dispute with China because that is where uh, all those issues come into being. But uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, the government of India believes that Maharaja's territory was this particular area, though Chitral was also to some extent a vassal, but most of the maps that the Britishers drew in 1946 uh, show Chitral outside Jammu and Kashmir. That's the only thing I would like. There's another question on the prominent language that is spoken in Gilgit Baltistan because you mentioned quite a few languages. So what would be the prominent language? See, as I said, uh, all these workshops are going to take place. Now, if you want me to tell, I can tell. The most, uh, the, the language which is spoken the most is Sheena. You have Sheena, you have Brushushki, you have Khowar, you have Waki, you have Domaki. These are the languages. Now, these languages are by and large not spoken anywhere in Pakistan. In fact, Sheena, uh, JKSC has done a phenomenal job. We have come out with the first Sheena Hindi dictionary. And I think we have come out with the... Uh, so we are trying because uh, the speakers of these languages perceive that their linguistic identity is being extinguished by Pakistan by not allowing them to pursue their languages because no... Uh, these languages are not taught, they are not propagated, there are no programs in these languages. So uh, that sense of alienation we are trying to remove by actually uh, providing them a platform by trying to nurture these languages which are trying to get extinguished. I mean, uh, I mean, we'll get to some of the languages like you mentioned, but somebody has again asked that do all these languages have scripts? None of these languages have scripts. So. You can use whichever uh, script is required. As of now, because Pakistan is there, most of them are using the Persian script. But in the past, other scripts have been used. But in uh, Baltistan, especially in Skardu, where uh, there is a huge movement to revert back to Tibetan script. And as a result, in Skardu and these places, the Balti language, which is spoken there, is now a lot of, uh, if you go to Skardu, you'll find half the sign boards in Tibetan script. So that's a, a revival of the Tibetan script because they feel uh, their language cannot be depicted correctly in a Persian script. And I think uh, the Tibetan script is the right script for them. Okay, uh, thank you. I think- can I ask, Yeah, can I ask him something? Yes, okay. please. Alokji, when you were talking of Azad Kashmir, you said 5 million and less of them were 5%, five, less than 5% speak Kashmiri. Were you trying to pass a message or was there something uh, more that you wanted to say on it? No, I was just trying to say that the territory which is occupied, firstly, uh, the, the so-called AJK as they call it, uh, uh -huh. we need to be very careful because firstly, they try to project it as the entire territory. And this is actually the way of fooling the world where they call it Azad, Jammu and Kashmir. What I was trying to say was that this particular territory is a very, very small part of the occupied territory and a very smaller part and an even minuscule part of the entire Jammu and Kashmir. And what is important is that the dominant language which is spoken, Kashmiri, is not even spoken by 5% of the population in this particular part. So very often the so-called president of AJK or prime minister of AJK start talking about Kashmiris and things like that. What I'm trying to say is that they have virtually no loka standi as far as uh, raising these issues are concerned. Very often Pakistan tries to project them on international fora as if they are the valid representative of the people of this part. And that we need to understand. What we see is on uh, ground reality, they yeah. only talk about ideological uh, differences with India particularly. Even if uh, they don't have anything, any resources uh, out there, still they are happy with their ideological partners only. 
if we uh, for example india provides them education india provides them economics but down at the bottom of the heart still that difference is there shall our uh, my question will be very short uh, shall our study include that particular aspect as well because i think that is the main important aspect same goes for our part of kashmir as well how do we tackle that kind of a situation see the first thing is that uh, this population of this occupied territories we have done nothing for them we have not even studied them we have not done anything for them i if you remember as lay as early as 2007 i had organized a conference and a lot of people had come from uh, this particular area and they said since we are citizens why don't you give us seats for us in iit and iims because we have no educational facilities there the government of india has certain seats for reserved for them in the assembly but we never conducted elections for them we could have done it there are so many provisions in fact uh, if you see uh, republic of china that is taiwan used to have seats for all the pakistan in fact so much so that the so called ajk what they calling muzaffarabad they have seats for people who have migrated from shrinagar anantnag baramula and jammu uh, udampur etc but we didn't have it so i think we also need to do something and that's where i think jksc has done a significant step where we are trying to nurture their language because one of their major grievances is that their cultural and linguistic identity is being extinguished and we need to create that environment where this can be nurtured so somebody if you have to actually bring him and he has to support you then you have to make sure that that person feels that yes you really mean and you have uh, something for them in your heart and that's what you have to reach out to them so we have to make efforts so that that sort of an alienation if at all it exists is not there but the fact is they realize that their rich culture their heritage is being extinguished by pakistan's onslaught and by the radicalization that's been unleashed by pakistan so i think uh, there is a sense of anger which we need to uh, harness thank you Jagdish Amani ji, kindly unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, thank you uh, once again. So uh, you know, referendum is usually being talked about uh, uh, either in UN or or otherwise also. So today, what is the ground reality uh, in uh, you know Pak occupied Kashmir uh, as well as the Gilgit uh, Baltistan? Today, if we go for referendum, what will the real What, what do you think will be the statistics well it's a hypothetical question and mm -hmm. as i said uh, uh, the question of a referendum does not exist today a referendum was a provision in united nations resolution but please understand the un resolution wanted pakistan to remove its troops and return the territory it was actually required to remove its troops remove all tribesmen who had actually come and then return the territory and then go for a referendum since pakistan did not comply with the un resolution we actually went ahead we had elections and that uh, assemblies passed resolution so i think uh, that to my mind is not a issue whether uh, if pakistan returns the territory and territory is with india for certain period of time and then if we have a referendum i'm sure they will uh, uh, those who have experienced pakistan's misrule would realize that but if the referendum has to take place under pakistan's occupation then obviously they will tinker with it you see the way elections are conducted in pakistan leave aside this so there are issues with that but as i said the referendum was an option which was at that point of time and pakistan had to comply with it pakistan did not comply with it so we went ahead and did whatever we had to do that's the legal position and that's the government of india's position as far as this is concerned so pakistan had to uh, comply with un resolution which it did not so that's how it is in a tiny observation the kashmir muslims do have, really would Hate to have anything to do with Pakistan, as long as people here understand it, it's fine. I know it. I've lived there for a short while, so they they would really hate to. Other than the bond of the religion, they have no respect or any thing to do do with these guys if they could avoid them. They do not like them. Now this is not what you'll hear publicly. This is a fact. 
but yes the religion thing gets in the way and then you find that you know the which is true of the rest of the country also that the common sensical muslim the sensible muslim has no voice and that's how things happen and that's how they are happening there that's all observation um hi can uh, can you all hear me yes, yes we can uh, thank you thank you alok ji there is a very interesting uh, session uh, though i am uh, absolutely a lay person to this entire uh, thing but uh, Uh, i'd like to know you you've sh uh, shown us a video of uh, people protesting against uh, the pakistan and all of that why isn't this kind of a news reaching the common people uh common people meaning common people in india common people in uk everywhere like uh, why isn't this news being telecasted anywhere not even in youtube nowhere and uh, that's the reason why many of the indians uh, are not aware that uh, the uh, you know the real kashmiris want to be in india see one of the reason as i said you get what you want today there is a period of artificial intelligence if you start looking into your uh, phone in your laptop in your computer about uh, mm -hmm. occupied territories you start looking about gilgit baltistan you will start seeing these videos these videos will start popping up unfortunately we most people this area has gone out of their mental space and that's why i said a country does not lose a territory just because somebody else has occupied it you only lose it when you lose it so what is important is what is the purpose of this workshop is that we get this area back into our mental space if you start looking you go to the uh, google and start looking for youtube's protests in gilgit baltistan you will start getting the picture and you see it for 7 days earth day onwards it will automatically start popping up because obviously the big tech has ai and they know what you want and that will start coming up similarly if the tv channels feel that the audience want it they will also start telecasting it so it's actually a public which has to want it if public wants it you will get it that's it thank you thank you dipankar ji your yeah. chance yeah sir sir i have a very i mean a, i mean a very pessimistic question i mean uh, the point is actually uh, with the cultural integration the political integration the etc etc kind of a things but now we absolutely know that with the cpec china is a part of you know that whole uh, geography so no matter what ever you know everybody does in terms of you know the cultural uh, revamping or the you know the political constitutions revamping etc this is a strategic question with cpc runs through that area and uh, it's a vein it's a artery you know from you know gwadhar to you know uh, the regions uh, the uh, the western region of china so that that's a strategic question i mean uh, china is a big strategic power in the region and uh, how uh, how does it see you know the, what is the government of india they might be doing they might be having some answer but this is certainly a very very big question to whatever efforts we put it put in over there i mean i said it's a pessimistic question so it's up to you how you take it sir i don't think so china can do much in fact chinese uh, are not very happy with the way cpec has been going on and in fact uh, i have been a very strong advocate in fact i have spoken to a lot of chinese interlocutors at different points of time that rather than going for cpec they should go for a road which runs from karakoram to kandla karakoram pass is one of the areas yeah, yeah. which is actually uh, which is actually undisputed and it's actually one of the boundaries where we have in fact uh, that would help us because eventually we also need an access to central asia and in today's context that access to central asia probably can go only through china because both pakistan and iran are having problems of their own so we have to go i think that's what i have been saying but as far as china is then it's a, its military power is over high please understand uh, uh, china's capacity to get into a conventional conflict uh, with a country like india is fairly limited i think uh, 62 is passing six decades since yeah, yeah, of indian mm -hmm. armed forces are strong enough to give them a befitting reply and china knows it in fact even the 63 agreement which china and pakistan have signed have said it's a provisional agreement uh, 
pending the final settlement of Jammu and Kashmir. So I think uh, the Chinese know CPAC is not an economically viable solution. It's not going anywhere. Though, of course, China is putting all its money because BRI is Xi Jinping's personal project. Uh, but to my mind, it's not going to be an economic success because if you see, if you track Pakistan, you know what, what is happening in Pakistan. Pakistan is virtually a bankrupt country today. The foreign exchange reserves is $5.69 billion, out of which $3 billion is Saudi deposit. Uh, you have uh, an, um, 2 billion plus of Chinese money deposited. So actually it is a negative. It's actually foreign countries deposit and it's actually a balance of trade is adverse $7 billion. And it has to pay around $36 billion over next one year. So Pakistan is in crisis. If actually IMF or none of these countries supported, Pakistan has actually gone down the drain. That's, I have no doubts about that. Uh, so uh, China is also thinking what to do. In fact, uh, if you look at it, the way Chinese have gone into Iran and they have opened another access from Central Asia to Iran, they are also looking at options, alternatives. Uh, there are huge problems with as far as Chinese investment in Pakistan is concerned. We keep seeing it on and off. You actually track uh, development. China-Pakistan ties are not as uh, good as it, they appear to be superficially from top. 